Uh, okay. Please, for attention, we can start uh, with the last third session uh, uh, for today working. Uh, I am Professor Oliver Andonov, the moderator in this uh, session, and first speakers will be the Mr. Eric Donners uh, with the topics of the Start Smart Traffic Accident Reporting. Mr. Donners, here you are. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Eero Donkers. I'd like to do uh, the presentation um, about STAR. That means Smart Traffic Accident Reporting. I think an issue that uh, we all into it. when you talk about road safety, accidents are very uh, important. And what I would like to tell you today is a project that we run in the Netherlands uh, at this, this, this moment. And I want to share you some experiences with that. Um, I'm from VIA. VIA is an ICT company that delivers uh, the software for uh, road safety analysis uh, in the Netherlands. That has been used by uh, all the municipalities, the provinces, the Ministry of Transport and the police itself. Um, and I'd like to uh, share with you uh, what we're doing. Um, then we look at the Dutch road safety policy. Um, we know, think we know that it started uh, in the 1970s in the Netherlands. Um, by collecting uh, the data from accidents. We based our road safety policy on that database. And we were very successfully, and you can see in this graph that the number of people who are killed and injured in traffic went down uh, dramatically, just because we based our decisions on evidence based on accidents. Uh, the Dutch approach uh, I'd like to show to you in a scheme is that uh, the police always started to go to an accident and they make a report of uh, what happened uh, with the accident and all the data go into a national database. Um, my company developed the software for, uh, to use uh, that data so that uh, all municipalities, uh, consultancy, uh, everybody who's involved in road safety has an easy way access to the data and to do all kind of analysis based on accidents. During the years, we started to collect more data, the data that helped us uh, to do a better analysis. So, for example, we collect data about speed, uh, citizens report, and design of the road. That kind of data we started to collect so that it is possible for everybody to have an easy signal when something is wrong in uh, road safety or to monitor the policy, to do analysis and evaluation, all based on accidents and data we collect together with the accidents. So we did well, uh, I showed in the graph, but there was always a but in that kind of situations. We had an evidence-based approach, but what happens when the data started to fail? Then you have a problem. And that's what's happening uh, right now in the Netherlands. Um, we have a big problem with under-reporting of accidents by the police. It is in fact now that no municipality, no province knows if they have a safe or unsafe situation in the Netherlands nowadays. So our successful approach of road safety is going away. It is not possible anymore to have a proper monitoring system to do analysis, to do evaluation based on accidents. And it is absolutely necessary. The number of people who are killed in traffic is going down, but the people who are injured in traffic is going up for five years now, and we don't know what to do because we don't have the right figures. So therefore, we developed this project. This project is called STAR. STAR means Smart Traffic Accident Reporting. It is an innovative collaboration uh, providing a reliable accident analysis by focusing on reporting uh, accidents uh, efficiently. Let's say there are three items in there. The first one is, it is an innovative approach, a collaboration between different kinds of organizations. That's the first step. Second step is that we want to make the reporting of accidents more efficiently uh, with the, the final goal to do proper analysis. How we did that is that we start with the cooperation. I told you in the beginning that 
the police was responsible to make the reports of the accident, but they say, okay, we don't want to make a report of accidents anymore because we're here to uh, not to make do the paperwork. We are the police, and we do. We have to look if people uh, was over speeding and if the, if it was drinking and driving, and that's what our focus is on. So. Um, Still, we said we have to solve this problem and work together. And therefore, we said, let's look at the complete chain from an accident happened. A proper record should be made from that accident so that we can do proper analysis. And for that chain, we start to work together with the National Police, the Dutch uh, Association of Insurance, and VIA. Let's have a small look at these three organizations. Uh, the initiators of this project, the first place is the police. The police want to support uh, um, everybody who is involved in accidents. They want to make sure that the situation is safe and if people get injured, that they get help. And they want to make sure that there is a proper uh, registration of an accident too. The insurance associations, uh, they want to have uh, improving of the customer services. Because people say in the Netherlands, I have to pay for that. What is, do I get back for that? And they want to have an efficient process of, uh, of, of all the claims. And that's an interesting point because a lot of people in the Netherlands have a car. They have a form in their car, a paper form for a European insurance uh, form that you have to fill in if an accident happened. And I know a lot of European countries have the same form. This form is more than 50 years old, and it is now time to modernize that kind of reports. So the insurance people were very interested in this idea. And via my company, we are responsible to give a good insight in road safety and make sure that we have the good data so that we can do the work on road safety. So these three, or these three organizations start to work together. The police said, we don't have money. So the insurance, and my company have to invest in this. So we have to develop the software and we have to run the project. The whole idea we started this is that we said that the paper form is not more of this time. So we wanted to have a mobile reporting by using an app on a smartphone. So therefore we made the choice. The first choice we made is that if someone is involved in an accident, that guy is responsible for the report of the accident. That's the first step we made. So it's not the police anymore, it is uh, it are the people who are involved in the accidents. And of course, we have in the Netherlands more than 9 million smartphones, and we have about 16 and a half million people. So it is very easy to use your smartphone with an app to make a report digitally. If you see the number, 9 million uh, smartphones, uh, it is hard to make an accident where someone, the, where nobody has a smartphone. That will not happen anymore because the number of accidents is still growing. So we have a lot of smartphones. We have an app on the smartphone and we say the people who are involved in the accident are responsible for the record of the accident. And we want to improve the data collection. First, we said we want to make sure that we have all the accidents in the database. Small accident, severe accident, all accident we wanted to have in the database. At the same time, we want to have the data real time available. Don't wait a year till we get the data from the police. We want it immediately available so we can respond if anything happened. And we want a complete overview of the accidents, not only a small items from the police, but a complete insight into what's happening, the Minerva diagram, photos, everything we want to have uh, in the database. And of course, it is like my organization, we are a private company. Still, we want to make sure that the database is open and available for everybody who wants to use it, because it is public data. We only take care of the collecting, collecting of the data, and we deliver the software to do so. So the STAR approach looks like this. If an accident happens, it's a small accident, and the police is not going to that accident, people are responsible to make a report of the accident by using the app themselves. If there is a severe accident, and the police goes to the scene, and then is, make the police make a report. If someone is 
injured in the accident and is hospitalized. In the hospital, he gets the question that he finally should make a report of the accident too. And the incentive to do so is that they want to get the money back from the insurance company. Because they're involved in an accident, they have damage in the car or the bike, or they are injured, they have costs for hospitalizing. So they want the money back from the insurance company, and that's the reason they want to do so. This data comes together from the police, from the hospitals, from the insurance, in one database. This information goes to the association of the insurance um, and to the police. Um, and all this has been done in the technically, IT technically environment of the insurance companies so that uh, they are allowed to have private information too because there is a business relation between them. After that, when they send in the form, immediately the form with the information from the accident is sent to our organization and directly goes into the software so that the municipality knows exactly how many accidents happened per day. And a lot of data is available, but not that much. We also thought if we have a questionnaire with more than 20 questions in there, people will not fill in the form. So we make it more easy for them so that they really start using the app and reporting the accidents. So therefore, uh, we have two steps. The first step is important for the insurance company so that you have an administrative uh, handling of, of the accident so that the insurance people only want to know where happened the accident, what happened, who's responsible. And as soon as they know who's responsible, they can uh, finalize the whole process. And because that is dignity done by using an app, they don't need people to hire uh, and to do the paperwork. It's been done automatically. The second step is that we want to collect the relevant safety information. We want to have a smart questionnaire, I will explain later. Um, and we want to have the exact location. Everybody knows who's involved in road safety, that exact spot of an accident is very important. Um, and we want to maneuver a diagram. And that's the reason why we also started to use a smartphone, because a smartphone has a GPS form. You zoom in, you can look at the map, you can change it a bit. And even you can draw your maneuver diagram by using your compass, just by using your phone like this, and then you can draw your maneuver diagram. The data collection uh, we, uh, we, uh, we started, we asked, is we make sure that the questionnaire is very small. Uh, we only ask the GPS code, uh, the date, and the time of the accident, and then uh, a small questionnaire about uh, the, what happened, the situation, and uh, some uh, information about the people, of course, uh, that we really want to know. After that, um, you can finish the form at home if you don't want to finish it on street. And we asked if you, you can have your email address so that we can contact you later if you want to do an in-depth study uh, on a particular kind of, uh, of accident. But the most of clever thing is what we also do is that we use a digital uh, connection between different databases to collect data. You don't have to ask uh, the weather conditions nowadays to someone because we have a database available wherein these weather conditions are reported. And we start using that databases. I show you. At the moment that you point on the map, the exact location, and we know the date and the time that this accident happened, automatically the form will fill in itself in the cloud. Because we have the database about uh, weather conditions, we have a data, by the data traffic flows, and we know the exact speed. We have database available with the geographical information, databases with, uh, you know, if the uh, road work was going on. That's what we call nowadays big data. All that kind of data is available. And if you have the exact coordinate, the date and the time, you can fill in the form automatically. The advantage is, is that we don't have to ask people who are involved in an accident. And the quality is much better. You can imagine if you ask 10 people, what is the weather conditions today? You get probably five or 10 different answers. If you do it by connecting it by the database, you have a quality answer that you can compare all accidents. There also were some new options. The first one is that we now have a real real-time insight uh, in the data so we can find some signals. 
Yeah? It's something new happened, uh, then you don't have to wait it. You can see it uh, after a few days of ha something happened. If, for example, we change the traffic lights and someone made a mistake and still accidents happen, don't wait a year. You have seen, can see in one or two months is what ha what's happening. Um, and because you have more statistics available, it is uh, easier to do a research and uh, to do analysis. In the Netherlands, we brought down the number of accidents uh, very much. Uh, if you want to do it more low, if you want to bring the number of accidents more down, then you need more detailed information. It is not enough to know that it is a bike or what happened. You need to know now what kind of bike, what conditions, uh, what kind of street. You need more information to find and then to de define the special targets group to bring down the number of accidents. And therefore, we need more data. We also started to use, to develop uh, new tools um, so that uh, we can inform the policy uh, on a better way. I have seen this morning a lot of presentations that people say, we build our road safety policy on a local way. But what is the problem when you do it locally? Politicians, municipalities, they have a lot of tasks, many tasks. And one of these tasks is road safety. So if you don't bring road safety into them in an easy way, it is hard to make decisions and to make money available for road safety. And therefore, we started to develop uh, an app for on uh, a smartphone. I have a small film here that you get an impression how it will work. Um, we have the, this is the data from four months that you already received. This, uh, unfortunately, is in Dutch, but I explain. Uh, this is the uh, province in the Netherlands um, with, with the city of Amsterdam. And on the left side, you just make a selection of a type of accident you want. For example, the method of transport. If you want to have the accidents with the moped or the bicycle, pedestrians, you just click on it and you get the results on the map. You see the number of accidents, what happened, and you can see exact spots of the accidents on the map. And this has been used on, uh, on an iPad or a smartphone. And in the Netherlands, it is so that a lot of politicians use this kind of devices. They use it uh, during the, the meetings, during uh, the, the decision-making process, they use it, and they have it now available. The advantages of this is that the police is using it, the, the mayor is using it, uh, the politicians who make decisions are using it, and it is very easy to use, and you can see in a few minutes is what's happening. You can zoom in, you see the number of accidents, you can make a polygon if you want to know in a certain area how many accidents happened in that area because we want to do a project. Or we have a lot of citizens who complain about the unsafetiness of an area. You just make a polygon like this, you can see the number of accidents, the numbers in here. You can see what is the problem, Is that, uh, what age is the problem, what is the matter of transport uh, people are involved. Only a few items are in there, just only to make sure that we give a signal to one to have to make a decision as what's going on. Of course, you also can uh, go zoom in on, uh, on a street and have uh, detailed information of every accident. Uh, the blue points are the number of accidents. The, this is, for example, four accidents. Just by clicking on it, it tells you what kind of accident happened over there. So there's some detailed information, but not too much. And the only reason why we do it on this way is because we want them to ask the questions, okay, we have a problem there, what are we going to do about it? And that's just the only thing what we want to reach. After that, we have the professionals who use our software to do a detailed analysis and to find out what's going on. So my last thing what I like to show to you is that um, we also made uh, another important step is because we closed a, a safety deal. If you want a project to do like this, you don't do it only with three organizations like the police and insurance company. You need a lot of organizations to stand behind the whole idea. Therefore, we signed in our national uh, road safety conference uh, last month the, the safety deal by 11 companies so that all the, um, the Ministry of Transport is involved uh, all the provinces are involved, all the municipalities are involved, the research institutes are involved, like SWOF, a lot of people know that. 
and uh, the road safety organizations are involved. And all they say is that they really believe that this new approach of STAR gives road safety a new boost. That it is important that we make an, a registration of all accidents and all kinds of accidents and that the way they will help us to make this project work. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Donkas. Our next uh, presenter is Mr. Tappan. Uh, Mr. Tappan, here you are, and please, uh, no more for 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, dear distinguished guests, uh, I'm going to make my presentation in three chapters. One, I would like to tell you uh, my thoughts about traffic. Number two, I'm going to tell you the statistics about Turkish traffic situation. Uh, number three, I'm going to tell you about who we are. I am an, uh, I'm the vice president of Turkish Inspectors Association, uh, and I'm going to tell you what we do and how our organization helped uh, the traffic uh, problems in Turkey to ease down, to decline. So maybe you can take an example. What you just have uh, presented five minutes ago, we as uh, Turkish uh, uh, Turkish uh, inspectors association we told the government to start this application seven years ago because when we had an accident it was a blocking the, the roads and there were, we were waiting the policeman to come and to, t to make a report but after our recommendation at, at, as it's been done in, in 50 for 50 years in Holland this application we started in Turkey seven years ago now when there's a uh, car accident with no injury or death, uh, two drivers, they just make a report, they sign it, and then they send it to the insurance company, and it's finished. So it's a very good application. All the countries who don't apply that should apply it in Africa and the rest of the world. Uh, first of all, I congratulate... First of all, I congratulate... Oh, sorry, this is what I'm doing. First of all, I congratulate all members involved for this nice and successful organization which is held here in Macedonia this year. As the representative of Turkish people, I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to express our opinion and concerns on the traffic issues in order to solve the problems indirectly preventing fatalities. So I believe that these kind of organizations must be seen as a worship because of the obligation to the human beings. And again, I believe that also these kind of activities must be accepted as a good deed by the God because of duty of, to the humanity. Our main objective is integration of Turkish society's way of living to developed countries' citizens about the traffic and road safety, but also to save our customs and culture to be in harmony globally. Now, during my presentation, I want to mention about some details of realities in Turkey about the roads, vehicles, drivers, and similarities, correspondence, compare and contrast of the behaviors, each other with Turkish and other nationality drivers, and finally, about honorary traffic inspectors. Uh, general situation. What is traffic? I think traffic is a mirror, mirror of society's way of behavior. The behavior changes from man to man, people to people, country to country. In some countries, traffic culture is improved, and in some countries, this culture is unimproved. For example, if your sidewalks are high, it means that you live in an undeveloped country. If your sidewalks are low, it means that you live in a developed country. Why? The main reason is 
if you are a citizen of a developed country, you don't need high side walks because you agree with the rules. Otherwise, if you don't agree with the rules, authority of the city has to make sidewalks higher. In other words, if we compare with developed and undeveloped countries, the height of sidewalks must be inversely proportional. We can tell some words about the sounds of the horns also. If you, when I lived five years in London, you don't see any horns. But if you come to Turkey, it's intermediate. If you go to India, they, they horn all the time. If you don't horn, they, they look at you if you are crazy. So the level of horn is also a measure of development to my understanding. If the sound of horn is high, the development is low. If it is low, the development is high. So as I mentioned before, traffic, the way we behave in observing traffic rules are a reflection of our behavior in general. In my opinion, road safety is foremost human rights issue. All drivers and passengers have the right to live. Nobody but only God should have the right to take it away from them. It should be all of us, our duty, to provide the safety conditions on the roads so that we all have a better and safer world to live in. We should educate our citizens properly, increase awareness so they can raise their voices and bring attention to these concerns. Drivers must remember that motorbikers and pedestrians have their same right to live as he or she does. Everybody must be careful in traffic. You must make a mistake. There are three definite results for these mistakes. They are one. One of them is prison, if you are guilty. Two, second way is hospital, if you are injured. Three, the second way is cemetery, okay. if you die. As we can all see, these are not an attractive places to end up at. We must use every possible educational tool to increase the awareness of these consequences. Here are some recommendations, if I may. All we need at the traffic, the, the, the answer is very simple. Toleration, responsibility, respect each other. We do, not, we do not need these recommendations only in traffic, but everywhere and every time of life. A person who obeys the rules even in his personal life will easily obey the traffic rules also. Responsible person in life means responsible person in traffic. A person who tolerates the others will also tolerate the people in traffic. All rules was born in law and in religion, religions. For example, Although you never drive in your whole life, also you need these recommendations to be a good citizen and to be a good religious. Now, here you can see uh, we are a country of 75 million uh, population. Uh, uh, we don't have 2013-2014 uh, uh, accurate numbers, so it's until 2012. Number of uh, accidents by 2012 in Turkey is 1,296,636. The number of deaths is 3,750 in 2012, and the injury is 268,102. I will give you some more statistics, which will give you an idea about Turkey. As you know, Turkey is a country like a rectangular shape, which is surrounded by Black Sea from north, by Aegean Sea from west, and Mediterranean Sea from south. Although she is surrounded by these three seas, the ratio of passenger transportation is only 1.5%. Transportation of freight is only 5%. Totally, the ratio of passenger transportation on the road is 92%. Totally transportation of freight is 85%. The summary of all these results show us that airways, railways, and seaways don't be used frequently like Germany, Canada, and Japan. I have to give you some information about Turkey statistical. Total roads are 64,000 kilometers, 51,000 ordinary roads, 11,000 kilometers divided roads, 
and 1,987 kilometer motorways, highways. Number of traffic police officers in Istanbul is 2,500. Just now, there are 12,300,000 vehicles in Turkey, and 2.6 million of them is in Istanbul, 30% of the whole country. Turkey has 1,700 accidents a day. Only in Istanbul, we have 600 accidents a day. We have uh, 11,000, 110,000 injured and 7,000 deaths of today. That's, that's, that is like a, like a war. It's been increased tremendously. Uh, and in Istanbul, uh, we have 9,000 injured. This, this 270 a year is not correct. The, 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 it it's, must be more than that. Maybe one-fifth of it. Uh, public transportation of Istanbul. Istanbul is the biggest city of Turkey and one of the biggest metropole in the world, which has two sides. One of them is on Asia and the other side is on Europe. The population is 15 million, so the traffic is going to be a big problem. Many people press from Asia to Europe and from Asia to Asia, from Europe to Asia every, every day by using two bridges. Now the third bridge is under construction and now there is a tube uh, by the road under the sea under construction. The length of Bosphorus is 33 kilometers and one and a half kilometer wide. So it is a natural sea road which doesn't need any repair or something like that. Unfortunately, we do not take advantage of this natural opportunity and also not everybody is using public transportation. Based on our experiences, there must be appealing factors for public transportation. Here are some. It must be cheap and economic, comfortable, full of safety and security, fast and frequently run, and integrated. Lastly, I'm going to tell you about who we are. Uh, Honorary traffic inspectors. 16 years ago, in 1998, there was a big revolution on the traffic laws of Turkey. The new and interesting formation was honorary traffic inspectors. The main reason for this creation was that the count of traffic policemen were not enough, so a lot of traffic guilds were no results and no punishments. The government decided to give some authority of the policemen to some civil citizens and they can write to license plate of some vehicles as a policeman. This ex exercising became extraordinarily successful and was deterrent of the traffic mistakes. But there were some qualifications requirements for inspectors. They must be over 40 years old and must be alumni for any university, graduated from a university, and also these people must be very respectable and important men and women in their society. For, a, for example, a car passed during the red light of traffic, but there is no policeman. If there is an honorary traffic inspector, he can give penalty to the driver. Now, there are approximately 28,000 inspectors in Turkey, and 3,800 of them live in Istanbul. And I'm the vice president of this uh, association and president of next year. Uh, our association advises law changes when necessary, as I mentioned earlier. For example, we advised the General Assembly seven years ago for changing the rules of accidents, which is accepted. After an accident without injury or death, two drivers will accommodate the document together and sent to their insurance companies as it is in European countries. It became more practical for drivers and for everybody in which the traffic was no longer held blocked and diminished the need for the policemen to write reports. Yes, we are inspectors, honor honorary traffic inspectors, but everybody can make a mistake. Here is a considerable agreement Uh, that we must use technology more and mostly every time because we human beings have the tendency to involve our feelings and this can cause an unfair decision. Besides, people do not argue with technological devices used to catch the violations. 
When you compare the roads, vehicles, and accidents of developed and undeveloped countries, you will see the differences between these countries. But if you compare the airways and planes, you won't see any differences because there are no initiatives, spoiled roads, asphalts are out of order for pilots. But all are avail available for users. Here is the importance of technology. The traffic is a very serious thing and do not tolerate any mistakes. And the road safety is necessary for everybody. With these realities, we have to improve the traffic culture, education, and industry and technology. Most of the traffic fines we come across are passing in red light, changing lines dangerously, not to obey turning rules, parking in no parking zones, driving too closely to the front vehicle, using horn when unnecessary. As you can see, most of these problems are education oriented. We can solve traffic accidents by improving the education level of the citizens. Again, it has been my pleasure to be part of this conference, and I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Now, uh, before I finish my speech, uh, I decided the last minute to share with you our project booklet of 2009. Uh, I want to give, because it is Turkish, I was not planning to make it in English and distribute to you, but I thought I will make a very quick explanation and some of the countries may take some ideas out of it. That is why I brought it with me. So I'm going to tell you page by page what it is all about in two seconds for every page. If you open the first page here, uh, the first page where there are advertising, this is to tell that advertisings with campaigns, but creating ambient advertising, we call it, surprising people or scaring people to, to, to create awareness of the dangers. For, for an example, here you see a children's uh, face hit by a car. This is put on the front window of the cars where it is school areas. It is not nice you, when you see it, you, you feel bad, but it is better if it can help uh, creating awareness. Or pedestrian path. You make it like it is uh, it's a morgue when people die, you put a sheet over it. So, so these are the campaigns, the importance of campaigns. You can create awareness and educate people with the support of media and successful campaigns. When we pass the second page, here it is talking about if you speed up the traffic, if the traffic is flowing, how much it helps to the economy of the country. Because instead of uh, arriving from one destination to another destination 10 minutes earlier with hundreds of thousands and millions of cars, the pollution to the environmental reasons, as well as uh, the, the consumption of extra oil, that is a huge burden on the economy. So this is to explain how important it is to have uh, 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 roads which are without bottlenecks uh, uh, and the signalization's importance. The third page I have here, this, this is on the right hand side, it's for countries who have uh, inspectors like us. In the, in, the, in the right page we choose an area where we think there's a problem not solved. So we, we go there in one month Every day we, we, we become Mr. densely Apam, controlling. finished for next two minutes. Please. Okay, okay. And, and then they get penalty and we, we, con we control it. The last page here on the right hand side, it is not nice to say, but this is used by the Americans, American police. They record it for any kind of misdoings of the police force. Recording the voice and by the cameras. This is also being used, started being used by the Turkish police. In case, it is also to protect the police in case somebody is accusing the police for not doing this. The last page is we, we create sponsorship for the traffic. When the traffic is blocked, uh, ambulance, uh, helicopter ambulance. And the right hand side, it's a very uh, cheap solution, mirrors. When you put the mirrors for 
uh, places where you cannot see the turning, that, that is a, a lifesaver. So this is for you to keep. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Now, uh, uh, we'll have, we have um, uh, change in the, our session. We'll go with uh, Mr. Branimir Miletic and uh, analysis of the traffic safety in Serbia with maps of risk municipalities current campaign of agency for traffic safety. And uh, after that, we'll go with uh, Mr. Uh, Dan Quinn. And last will be the Mr. Martin Doyle. Good My Makedonski is ideal. Pa ću prezentaciju izložiti na srpskom, napred se izvinjavam prevodiocima, verujem da ćemo se razumeti, pričat ću nešto sporije, a i prezentacije su na engleskom, tako da mislim da će svako naći sebe. Poštovano predsjedništvo, dame i gospodo, želim da vas pozdravim ispred Agencije za bezbednost saobraćaja Republike Srbije. Zahvaljujem se domaćinima na pozivu i na ovoj sjajno organizovanoj konferenciji. Uvijek kad sam u Makedoniji osjećam se kao da sam kod svoje kuće. Ja imam dve prezentacije koje ću spojiti na neki način jer su bliske jedna drugoj i mogao bih da ih nazovem sa jednim pitanjem gde smo, šta radimo i šta ćemo raditi. Ova prva prezentacija odnosi se na analizu stanja bezbednosti saobraćaja ali pre toga pokažem slike iz Srbije koje su preplavile internet a verujem da ste mnogo toga već i videli dakle prolazim na stanje bezbednosti saobraćaja druga prezentacija odnosi se na indikatore bezbednosti saobraćaja i o tome nešto kasnije Ovdje možete vidjeti diagram od 2000. godine kako se kreće broj poginulih u Srbiji do 2013. 2013. je zabeleženo 650 poginulih, što je najmanje od kako se prati statistika bezbednosti saobraćaja u Srbiji. Profesor Dimitrovski vam je već pokazao ovaj diagram gde se vide i poginuli i povređeni, teško i lako, pa mislim da nema potrebe da komentarišemo. Ovde su dati povređeni i poginuli u odnosu na tipove saobraćenih nezgoda. Kao što vidite, najžešće, najteže posledice su kod naletanja na pešaka, kod direktnih sudara, sletanja, vozila sa puta i tako dalje. Opet ću pokušati prema onoj kineskoj da jedna slika vredi hiljadu reči, da se više zadržim na slikama, a manje na tekstu. Dakle, ovde možete da vidite izdvajan ovaj ovde deo diagrama gde su poginuli, kao što vidite, preko 50% zbog nepropiste, neprilagođene brzine kretanja. Za sve one koji žele detaljnije podatke, ostaje prezentacija i mogu detaljnije da analiziraju ovo. Ovde su procentualno date učešće poginuli lica u zavisnosti od kategorije učesnika 2012. i najnoviji podaci za 2013. Naravno, najugroženiji vozači slede putnici i pešaci koji se smenjuju, ali verujem da je to slično i u ostalim zemljama. Ovde možemo da vidimo da su letni meseci, pre svega juli, avgust, pa i septembar, najkritičniji kada je Srbija u pitanju i stradanje u saobraću. Evo možete videti. A ovde možete vidjeti učešće poginulih vozača, pešaka i putnika u zavisnosti od starosti. Ja ovde želim da istaknem dve stvari. Jedna je 
da preko 65 godina pešaci preko 50% poginulih je u toj starostnoj grupi. Dakle, više od pola pešaka u Srbiji su stariji od 65 godina. Također, jedna od najugroženijih kategorija starostnih su mladi, kao što vidite ovde, od 26 do 35 godina. Evo još jednom o pešacima, starost preko 65 godina, to je ovaj diagram ovde. Takođe, poginuli vozači, pešaci i putnici, vidite da je veoma ugrožena i starostna grupa mladih od 19 do 25 godina. Pređemo na decu i na stradanje dece. Dakle, ovde možete da vidite kako se kreće od 2002. godine stradanje dece i ono što je izuzetan rezultat i, ajde da kažem, mogu da se pohvalim i radom Agencije za bezbedno savraće Republike Srbije, da smo značajnim radom doprinjeli da u 2013. imamo najmanje poginule dece od kako se prate ovi rezultati. Takođe povređena deca, možete da vidite ovaj diagram od 2002. do 2013. godine. Kad je u pitanju procentualno učešće na stradale i poginule dece do 14 godina, ja bih ovde izdvojio samo ovaj podatak ovde. 62,5% poginule dece su putnici. Dakle, to je nešto što treba da zabrine sve odrasle, roditelje pre svega. Jer očigledno da deca stradaju krivicom odraslih. I ako možemo da kažemo da dete napravi grešku i strada kao pešak, ali kao putnik nema nikakve njegove greške, ili je vozač rizikovao previše, napravio grešku, ili dete nije bilo vezano, ili nije imalo bezbednostno sedište itd. Ovde možete videti mape rizika javni i saobraćeni rizik. Javni znači u odnosu na broj stanovnika, saobraćeni u odnosu na broj vozila, u Srbiji, po opštinama, naravno ove crne opštine su najkritičnije, tamo su najviše ugroženi u saobraći. Ovde možete videti utice alkohola i brzine. Znači alkohol, ovaj gornji diagram, i brzina dole od 2002 do 2011. godine. Šta je ono što radimo u zadnje vreme? To su određene kampanje kojima nastavimo da ajde kažem, popravimo stanje, promenimo svest ljudi. Posebno bih izdvojio ovu kampanju pažnja sad koju posvećujemo deci i to pre svega džacima prvacima i džacima drugog razda osnovne škole, dakle sa sedam i osam godina starosti i mislim da smo tu imali značajne rezultate. Takođe, ovo je kampanja Traktor na putu bezbedan i uočljiv, imajući u vidu da su traktori takođe jedna od ranjivih kategorija, odnosno vozači traktora i putnici na traktorima. Radimo jednu kampanju za mlade, delom vezano i za konzumiranje alkohola. To je nešto na čemu ćemo raditi narednih meseci, kao i kampanju posvećenu letnjim mesecima, odnosno stradanju, videli ste povećanom stradanju učesnika u saobraćaju tokom leta. I na kraju ova kampanja veže pojas, vežimo pojas u okviru koje smo uključili i predsjednika Republike, gospodina Nikolića. I mislim da smo imali značajne efekte, iako nikako nismo zadovoljni vezivanjem pojasa pre svega na zadnjem sedištu, a o tome ću pričati u narednoj prezentaciji.
ovo je jedan slajd, odnosno baner, koje su kolegi iz Crne Gore postavili na internetu, da bi predstavili kako se može pomoći Srbiji u ovim uslovima ogromnih poplava i ljudskih života i matine štete. Ja bih zamolio drugu prezentaciju. Ovo je projekat metode praćenja indikatora bezbednosti saobraćaja u Srbiji i značaj za strateško upravljanje bezbednošću saobraćaja. Mogli bi da kažemo da je to za nas možda nešto novo, razvijene zemlje već odavno rade to. Šta je suština toga? Da prestanemo da čekamo prolivanje krvi na putevima i da onda vršimo analize kao što su i one prethodne. Naravno da moramo i to da radimo ali da pokušamo upravo preko ovih indikatora da dođemo pre toga do činjenice, do stanja i šta nas očekuje ukoliko ljudi ne vežu pojas, ukoliko razgovaraju mobilnim telefonom, ukoliko decu ne stavljaju u bezbednost na sedišta, ukoliko prekoračuju brzinu, ukoliko upravljaju vozivom po dejstvom alkohola i tako dalje i tako dalje. I indikatori su brojni, možemo da ih nabranjamo desetine i desetine, pa i stotine, ali svakako da smo morali da se opredelimo za neke ključne i najosnovnije. To smo i uradili u okviru ovoga projekta koji smo završili prošle godine, ali to je nešto što se trajno radi i nastavljamo to i ove godine. Naravno, projekat je baziran i na najboljoj evropskoj praksi, iskustvima, definisana je metodologija, odabrali smo neke ključne indikatore, vidjet ćete koje. I svakako da nam je cilj bio osnovni cilj, da taj projekat se implementuje, ali i da taj projekat pokaže sve institucije koje nedovoljno se bave svojim poslom u ovoj oblasti. Dakle, svako na osnovu ovog projekta može da vidi koliko je radio i koliko je malo radio. Dakle, evo šta je projektni zadatak definisao, te ključne indikatore, njihovo rangiranje, izbor nekih osnovnih indikatora, vidjet ćemo koji su posle, definisanje modela i predlog za poboljšanje. Evo koji su to indikatori. Dakle, sigurnosni pojas, sistemi zaštite dece u vozilu, upotreba sigurnosnih kaciga i vožnje pod dejstvom alkohola. Prvi korak je bio da definišemo tu širu listu indikatora, drugi je objektivna procena korelacijone veze indikatora i bezbednosti saobraćaja i naravno primjena ekspertske ocene za izdvajanje onih ključnih indikatora koje sam predstavio. Evo šta je ono što mi smatramo da bi u Srbiji bili ključni indikatori. Dakle, ovdje možete da ih vidite. Procenat upotrebe sigurnostnog pojasa, procenat vozača koji poštuju ili ne poštuju brzinu, procenat upravljanja pod neistom alkohola, procenat upotrebe sigurnostne kacige, zatim upotreba mobilnog telefona, vreme odziva hitnih službi, procenat upotrebe dnevnih svetala i na kraju starost vozila. Evo neki odabrani rezultati projekta. Možemo da vidimo gde se nalaze pojedine zemlje, naravno tamo gde je crna boja, tamo nije dobro. Ili još bolje da pogledamo kako stoji Srbija i neke druge zemlje, ili još bolje u odnosu na neke druge zemlje. S obzirom da bi se o ovome moglo mnogo toga reći, ja ću samo da kažem dve stvari. Jedno, kao što vidite, Srbija, bez upotreba sigurnosnog pojasa na zadnjem sedištu, 
3%. Nemačka 97%. Kada sam jednom prilikom rekao mom dragom profesoru Milan Vujaniću koji je trebao da bude danas ovde, da bi smo vezivanjem pojasa na zadnjem sedištu. Bar onoliko koliko se vezuju vozači i putnik na prednjem sedištu. Mogli da spasimo najmanje sto ljudskih života. On, koji je ekspert u ovoj oblasti, je rekao minimum dvesta. Znači, evo šta stručnjaci misle o tome. Ovde su procenti vezani za i sumirani ukupno vozač, suvozač i putnici na zadnjem sedištu. A ovde je upotreba sigurnosnih pojaseva putnika na zadnjem sedištu na svim putima po policijskim upravama, znači mogli bi da kažemo regionalno, po određenim regijama u Srbiji. U Srbiji postoji jedna izreka što južnije, to tužnije. Čini mi se da ovaj diagram baš to dobro predstavlja. Dakle, vidimo Vranje 0,5%, Subotica, naravno da je i ovo malo, ali mnogo više nego Vranje, kao što vidite. Evo upotreba zaštitnih sistema u Srbiji i zemljama u svetu. Dakle, opet možemo da se poredimo 18% Srbija, evo Francuska 89%. Također za decu do 12 godina upotreba zaštitnih sistema nije idealno, ali je nešto bolje nego oni pojasili koji sam pokazio. Ili evo recimo vozači procentualno koliko vezuju pojas na ovim mapama. Kao što vidite, putnici pozadi, cijela Srbija, nažalost, crna. Inače, neki standard koji se u Evropi uzima jeste da se ispod 70% vezivanja pojasa pretira kao 1%, kao 10%. Znači, uopšte se ne uzima u obzir. Ono što je iznad 70%, to se rangira. Dakle, 70% je neka kritična granica do koje se mora doći. Procenat vozača koji upravljaju vozno po dejstvom alkohola, nažalost, kao što vidite, dosta crnih regiona i nešto bolje stanje kada je u pitanju korišćenje zaštitne kacige od strane motociklista i vozača mopeda. Šta su nam očekivanja? Pa ja ću samo dve stvari u odnosu na ova dva slajda da kažem dok vi gledate. Jeste da konačno prestanemo da čekamo prolivanje krvi na putevima, da bi smo vršili analize i onda predlagali neke mere. Daleko je bolje i bezbolnije i jeftinije ovo. Pratiti gde se nalazimo ako uzmemo osnovne parametre, dakle indikatore bezbednosti saobraćaja i drugo, ovaj projekat, ova studija koju nastavljamo da radimo, apsolutno će svim institucijama koje se bave ovom oblašću staviti do znanja koliko rade ili još bolje koliko ne rade svoj posao. Ja vam se zahvaljujem. Thank you, Mr. Miletic. And now, Mr. Dan Quinn, World Rescue Organization, please, here we are. Just before the presentation is loaded, I'd um, just like to thank uh, Lepri, the chair, the organizers of the event, and all of yourselves as well for giving us the opportunity to deliver this presentation to yourselves. Thank you very much. You. My name is Dan Quinn. Okay. Um, my name is Dan Quinn from the United Kingdom Rescue Organisation. The UKRO is a group forming part of the umbrella organisation which I'm here to talk to you today about called the World Rescue Organisation. 
My role within the UKRO is I'm the extrication lead. So I'm responsible for a team of 40 to 45 assessors, fire and rescue service and medical personnel around the UK that deliver the rescue challenge concept that I'm going to tell you about today. A colleague of mine is also going to join me and he is the head of rescue disciplines for the UKRO and he's also the international development program manager for Romania. And the reason I've brought him along today is so that he can actually provide you with an example case study of the WRO and the International Development Programme in action, actually what it looks like. So, to start. So the World Rescue Organisation was formed in 1999. As I said, it acts as an, an umbrella organisation to individual national rescue organisations of which I'm going to show you a slide in a minute to identify the 15 current members of the World Rescue Organization, most of which have gone through the International Development Program. It's a registered charity. You can see the number in the bottom right-hand corner uh, within the UK. And as I said, it operates with the sole support of volunteers, but all of whom are serving fire and rescue service personnel and or medical professionals within their own organisations. So these are people that are maintaining their skills and maintaining their competencies on a daily basis. What we seek to do through international development is develop international partnerships, like this for example. We then also look to host a World Rescue Challenge, which I will show you the, the last events that we've hosted for the previous 15 years. This year's is going to be in England. And also through the International Development Programme. Now, I'm sure that this presentation will be made available at a later date. And if it is, the links that are integral within it will take you to more information about the International Development Programme and the World Rescue Organisation. So you'll be able to find out a bit more information with regards to what we do. The final thing, as I mentioned, we have 15 members over five membership levels currently, with another few to be joining us this year, for example, Moldova and Nigeria. It's a little example of the organisations that currently form part of the World Rescue Organisation at the various different levels that are mentioned. And you can see we range across the whole of the world and we've got representatives that are equivalent to the United Kingdom Rescue Organisation being level one members and also those that are by association develop and progress within their own focus country. So what do we aim to do? The aim is basically to provide a platform for rescue and medical personnel around the world to share and advance rescue science and technology. And basically the reason why we do that is looking at the UN decade of action. I've witnessed presentations that have taken place today that regards to the first four pillars, we undertake a hell of a lot of activity with regards to road safety messages to improve circumstances and situations to try and prevent road accidents from occurring. And with the best intentions, unfortunately, we'll never be able to eradicate that. So what we focus on is the fifth pillar. What, what happens once that crash has occurred? What happens? What do we do? How can we get better at saving life at that stage? And that's the focus of the World Rescue Organization. So just a quick quote about the management of victims. And you can see it's originated from a national peer review. The reason I like to focus on this is when you read the content of the fifth pillar under the UN Decade of Action, it puts a lot of emphasis on the medical trauma care related to the casualties. If you go to a bog standard RTC, which is obviously what Kevin and I do on a regular basis, Provision of care is only going to be as effective as the ability of being able to remove the casualty from the vehicle. And when you're at that stage, you're actually extricating a person from a vehicle. All three emergency services need to be working together and coherently. They need to be all fulfilling their roles. And this is, again, what we do as part of the World Rescue Organization is promote that development. And we would term it as the casualty-centered rescue. This slide is supposed to be demonstrating what's called trimodal distribution. 
And it's the three stages where in the event of an accident, a crash, the areas where people can expect it or are evidenced as unfortunately resulting in fatal injuries. If we look at the first stage, and this is all within the fifth pillar, the first stage is on impact. On impact is where prior to all of the four, the four, four pillars come into play, all of your efforts leading up to the road safety lead up to that, hopefully, that never occurring. However, the fifth pillar, once it's happened, on impact equates to 30% of all fatalities worldwide. Okay? If you look at the on-scene, so we're talking within the next hour, equally, that takes 30% of all fatalities. And then finally, in the hospital, which is days, weeks, or months later, we're looking at 40% of all fatalities as a broad sort of approximation. And so the fifth pillar, as it's demonstrated there, really tackles the on-scene and the in-hospital. We use a term called the golden hour within the UK. And within the golden hour, there's a period of 20 to 25 minutes that allows the emergency services once on-scene to provide that level of care by getting to the hospital as soon as possible to increase the prognosis for recovery. And everything that we do within the WRO is geared around trying to make the best use of that time and provide that best possible care. Okay. There's a little visual demonstration by the clock with regards to the golden hour. And it's just to push home that message about the UN decade of action is obviously front loaded with the four pillars relating to road safety. But don't forget pillar number five. Okay, what do we do in the event of the crash having occurred? And small changes can make a massive difference. This is actually uh, an example of a project that's still ongoing uh, and it initiated some time ago in a place called Sakhalin in Russia. And what was identified as part of the scoping visit that was undertaken a few years back was that the emergency services were not working together as well as they could do in our casualty-centered approach. So if you had an accident, I'm sure in many of our countries, you will find that the fire rescue service, the medical service, and the police service all have a part to play and all work together to be able to extricate a casualty. In this particular example, the medical personnel were actually waiting until the fire rescue service removed the casualty from the vehicle and then started to provide trauma care. And obviously without that early intervention, working at both the medical and the physical extrication at the same time, it caused a significant increase in the number of fatalities within that particular part of the world. By a simple change like that, made a significant difference. And this is the work that the World Rescue Organization and particularly the International Development Program aims to achieve within any focus country. What we will do is we won't impose particular standards relating to the UK, because that only fits the UK. We work with the focus country upon their request to identify what suits their needs and their makeup and their breakdown of emergency services. How does it look best to achieve this goal within their focus country? Okay. So the four main stages, and at this next point I'm going to hand over to my colleague to go through a case study for Romania. This is how it generally works. At stage one, we receive a request for assistance, and it can come in many forms. And again, when you get the presentation, that link will take you to the website, which details exactly how you would go about doing that. We then work with the focus country to identify what does it look like, what the problems exist, go out and actually visit the relevant organizations and generate interest in order to progress and ultimately lead to a sustainable process within the country. So stage two is we implement an agreed action plan start off with a project initiation document and we look to come into a focus country and spend ideally three to four years to a point where we can be able to walk away and the focus country is completely self-sustainable. Right? And at that point, we would expect that they would have attained level two membership of the World Rescue Organization. So that's short of only hosting a World Rescue Challenge. So stage three will be that development. Progressive development, depending on what the needs are, and I'll show you that with the Romania case study. And then finally, the follow-up and monitoring. As my colleague will go through, we're at that stage now with Romania. 
We've done a lot of the work. They've got themselves into a position where they're level two members, and he's now going to be going out next week to do that stage four. So thank you very much for your time. I'm going to hand you over to my colleague. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you may not notice by the accent, I'm actually from a different country than Dan. Although I'm from the UK, I'm actually from Scotland. Um, so I'm having to slow my voice down, or you won't, because I normally talk as quick as this, and you won't be able to understand me. Um, Dan already mentioned I am the Head of Rescue Disciplines. I'm a serving member of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, um, which is now the third largest fire and rescue service behind Tokyo and New York. Um, and I'm also the lead uh, for the International Development Programme for Romania, as he said. Now, the Romanian pro project, don't worry, it's only a couple of slides just to give you a taste of what we actually do. Um, the first contact um, we received from the IGSU in Romania um, was from them to us requesting some assistance and some information. That was back in 2007. Um, we had a few discussions with them and then invited them across to the UK to one of our challenges. Um, and in fact, they came across to Cardiff uh, to the 2008 World Rescue Challenge. Um, they actually came in 2007 to look at the United Kingdom Rescue Challenge. Um, they were impressed by what they seen, um, especially in the World Rescue Challenge, where up to 18 to 22 different countries from around the world take part in a challenge platform to pass on ideas, to gain information, and basically what we are looking for is to come up with the best practice in order to deal with road traffic accidents once they happen. No one organisation and no one country is the best. We are all the best together. We can all learn from each other. And it's all about partnership working and getting best practice from each other. And some of the photographs you'll see are actually from the rescue challenges themselves. In 2009, we developed a training program and uh, one of the UK Fire and Rescue Services went out to Romania um, and assisted with some training and development with them. And together, we basically uh, came up with um, their own development plan. Now, this was created by the head of the IGSU in Romania. It wasn't the UK's plan. It wasn't our plan, it was Romania's plan for what they required and they needed. And that's the most important thing that we do. It's whatever the development country needs. And it's their plan that we take forward, not our plan. So in 2011, uh, we had a scoping visit um, and they wanted to run their own national challenge. And national challenges are a fantastic platform for training. And I'll come on to the reasons why in the last slide. Um, training is most important. If we don't train together with the other emergency services, the, unfortunately, the casualty will not have the best chance of survival. So in 2012, the first Romanian challenge was held and a full logistics and assessing team went out from the UK. More importantly, when we went out there, we assisted in training the Romanians up to uh, assessor level and basically they shadowed the UK assessors so that in the future they could be self-sustaining and they in turn could train their own assessors to take forward the challenge concept. It was a great success, 15 teams competed in total in their very first challenge um, and after delivering the workshop, uh, Romania became a level three member of the WRO. Moving on from there, two uh, of the SMRD Foundation medical assessors, uh, trauma assessors, attended the 2012 World Rescue S uh, Challenge and two firefighters from the IGSU came across to the World Rescue Challenge in London uh, to shadow assess. So already in two and a half years, we have some Romanian personnel already at world level using their skills to spread and teach across the world. In 2013, uh, just last year, was the second Romanian national challenge. It was held in uh, uh, Oradia. 
basically, and uh, sorry, it was held in the Targi Muraj and over two days, and basically nine teams took part. Now, the reason there was less teams was because Romania took everything on board and they held regional challenges. So their first challenge was one challenge was 15 teams. In the second year, they held nine individual rescue challenges around the regions, with each of those regions having 10 teams taking part, both for trauma and for extrication. So it was the top nine teams from those regions around Romania that took part in their national challenge. And they also had complex scenarios uh, rather than standard scenarios where we use more simulated casualties. In fact, we actually use live uh, casualties within the vehicles. These are just some photographs of the challenge. Um, not a great picture. But as you'll see, the, the crews dressed in red are the Romanian assessors and some of the crews dressed in blue um, are for quality assurance from the World Rescue Organization. This was in Ploesti near Bucharest. This is in Oradia, a bit of a change in weather. It was pouring with rain and it was more like a water rescue than a road traffic rescue sometimes which we are used to in Scotland. This is the trauma challenge. We developed a trauma challenge where uh, the trauma teams um, go in and do moulages. And again, they're assessed by qualified medical personnel. Um, and we have doctors, uh, that's one of the surgeons from uh, the Oradia Hospital. And the final extrication. So following the second national challenge, uh, basically they developed so high that two assessors were chosen from Romania to take part in the World Rescue Challenge in Florida last year in October uh, in the US. And they basically ran the World Trauma Challenge between the two of them. And that's the sort of standard that they reached in, uh, so far in three years in Romania. The ongoing development we're having is uh, a creation of a sustainable action plan and basically this is Romania's action plan. So through the Romanian uh, rescue organisation, they have developed a plan for themselves to take forward and push them forward and we will assist them. As I say, it's what the developed country needs, not what other people require to move them forward. And the third Romanian national challenge is being delivered in Oradia this year in October. Um, and they're actually wanting to introduce uh, USAR, Urban Search and Rescue. So they're going to have uh, an extrication challenge, uh, a trauma challenge and an urban search and rescue challenge this year, which again is pushing the boundaries and moving the country forward. I did say I was going to mention the benefits of training through rescue challenges. It creates a platform uh, I would uh, like of competition. Please, uh, the finish it's, to do it's the last please. slide. It's the last slide. Okay. It demonstrates the skills of all personnel. They can practice and learn new techniques from each other. It gives exchange of ideas. They can be uh, assessed against recognised standards and provide constructive feedback. But the last sentence is the most important. This will facilitate worldwide best safe practice and that's what we're here for, is to create a best safe practice and use the skills from every country in the world, what's best practice and develop that around the rest of the world. Those are some of the challenges since 1999 in the countries that have been held in. And if you need any further information, that's the email address for both Dan and myself. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. We have a chance to uh, look at the exercise of the uh, fire rescue team uh, two days before. Uh, and now the last uh, present presenter for today is the Mr. Martin Doyle. Uh, please help with the technical. Uh, about the partnership in practice. And after that, so when we, Mr. Martin finished, uh, I have two information uh, for all. Okay, here you are.
Thank you, Oliver. I'm just going to practice with this first, make sure I've got it right. Fine. Good afternoon. My name is Martin Dowell. I'm the Senior Manager for Road Safety within Cheshire Fire and Rescue Service. I've held this post since 2007. I also work for the Chief Fire Officers Association in Great Britain and hold the Vice Chair of the CFOA Road Safety Executive Board. I'm Chair of CFOA's Road Safety Practitioners Group, which is one of the four work streams come out, which come out of the Road Safety Strategy. I also chair CFOA's Northwest Fire and Rescue Services Road Safety Lead Officers Group. Over the next 20, 30 minutes, I'll give you a, a whistle-stop tour of my own services involvement in road safety. I will initially explain Cheshire Fire and Rescue Services involvement with regard to working with partners to the benefit of all. This includes local authority road safety officers, Road Safety Great Britain, Police, at national level the Association of Chief Chief Police Officers and locally with Cheshire Constabulary. I will explain our journey working with local authorities across Cheshire, which is a county in the UK of approximately one million people, one city, 11 major towns, 12 smaller towns and large villages. So we're probably half the size in population of Macedonia. We as a service have had to look at the ever-changing world of road safety agenda from either a government or a UK government perspective through to a more local view, balancing what my service could morally achieve as core business, i.e. not costing any more money. This involved a huge training programme for all of my staff, including firefighters, of which there are 600 of them, and all my community safety staff, of which are a further 30. Education, education, education is the way forward to reduce road safety issues. Today I will focus particularly on our partnership with Cheshire East as a case study delivering road safety as a commissioned service to all their schools, of which are 130 at primary school, which are small children, and 21 to higher school level. And I look ahead, uh, and I fully appreciate that this is a million dollar stroke, million dinar, dinar question, but what I can tell you from a fire and rescue for service perspective is that we in the UK are here to stay, help, and can, and will deliver a comprehensive road safety educational product, either in isolation, or more importantly, with partners as a group activity. This particular partnership has developed and evolved over time, seven years in fact. Issues have developed with both organizations over a period including the financial crisis, which has led to severe financial constraints on both our organisations. This will look through the journey of what we've uh, achieved. Drive Survive was first delivered across Cheshire from June 2000. It was a multi-agency approach to delivery of a road safety product, and it was delivered to young people, 16 to 18 year olds. Fire, police and ambulance, including doctors, were all part of this flagship multi-award winning road safety presentation. Between 2000 and 2006 and 7, we had ad hoc delivery. Then I came into the picture around 2007, 2008, and a more formal approach was, was moved forward. 
Road safety was written into Cheshire and Fine Rescue Services integrated risk management plan. These are our local plans which all 51 Fine Rescue Services work to. They identify risks to the public, not just road safety. Through this, data and intelligence direct individual fire and rescue services to focus and target resources to minimise and reduce the risk. 2008-9, road safety was written into the fire and rescue services operational delivery plans for our operational firefighters and community safety staff to actually deliver. This proved very successful uh, and as a test case from a CFOA and individual fire and rescue services, as it proved, fire and rescue services could deliver an influential road safety product or campaign. After evaluation of this campaign, which gives us or gave us extra uh, credence and evidence that it worked, it was then delivered again across the UK as a road safety day in 2011. Again in 2012 and 13, building on that success from previous years. It was delivered in partnership with local authorities and other partners, including the police and ambulance services and a number of other road safety charities. It was expanded to deliver over a week-long campaign. Moving on, when Cheshire Fire and Rescue Service became the first fire and rescue service to be commissioned to deliver road safety in 2012, delivering what was known as Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 4 educational programmes to children across Cheshire East. In 2013, we saw road fatalities drop in Cheshire to the lowest ever recorded, 27. And I'm just going to mention we talked about the population of Cheshire and the population of Macedonia. Probably Macedonia is twice as big as my county. You have approximately 140 people dying on your roads in Macedonia. I have 27, so I would double that and say it's around 50, which actually pulls out about three times more. So I suggest we are doing something correct. I fully appreciate there are many other factors involved not just road safety education. Car design, car design is, has advanced rapidly over the last number of years. Road engineering has its name to play. But I sincerely believe that fire and rescue services have made a significant, have had significant difference. Cheshire Road Safety Partnerships came into existence in 2007 where local authorities worked in partnership for the first time, where local authorities worked in partnership with the police and fire services. This has since been remodelled and has meant local authorities, four in my county as you can see here, uh, were independent, a bit like Macedonia's decentralisation. They were independent to align resources as and where they saw fit, using the data and intelligence. Making sure the gentleman on the front row is okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this started a new process where local, local authorities asked fire and rescue services and police to be part of local authority multi-agency road safety plans. With the four unitary areas all with varying road risks, developing relationships with both our services. My county is a county of contrasts. Halton and Warrington, at the top of the screen in blue and red, are urban, large known risks to pedestrians and cyclists. With our two larger areas below, Cheshire East and Cheshire West and Chester, more far more rural, with major towns and cities isolated by Cheshire's rolling countryside, which highlight other risks, young drivers and motorcyclists, to name two. On top of this, further implications to the road safety agenda came into place with an appointment of a police crime commissioner, PCCs. Some of these PCCs had road safety in their agenda, others did not. In Cheshire, 
the Police Crime Commissioner had road safety as a priority. This proved to be a real positive outcome. Through discussions with this chap, uh, senior police officers have now developed a joint working road safety plan, fire and police. This is now developed into a joint working road safety plan started in 2014, just over a month ago, for both blue light emergency services to work to. Financial pressures on councils have meant that local authorities have had to work at delivering their responsibilities in a more diverse way, but not just in road safety. In Cheshire East, that meant commissioning the road safety educational element to ourselves, the fire service. And this really is the case study. In 2011, Cheshire Fire and Rescue Service were commissioned to deliver road safety in two specific areas to Key Stage 2, which is around 9, 10 and 11 year olds, and Key Stage 4, which is 15, 16 and 17 year olds. This was done due to financial constraints on the Council and hence the commissioning to ourselves. We developed educational packages for both Key Stage 2 and 4, working with Cheshire East Local Authority. We trialled the programmes in a number of schools, working with teachers, and students to ensure we looked at the correct level of engagement and interaction by fully engaging with the students. We wanted that one-to-one -one benefit. We had to make this work. The eyes of many services and authorities were upon us and we had to make it work successfully. We trained our community safety staff, 30 of them, running training sessions, utilising a complete quality assurance matrix to ensure their competence to deliver would be maintained over a long period. The biggest issue we actually found was trying to fit the requirements into a one hour session, especially at Key Stage 2, where the children found the interactive programme so hard to keep to one hour, they asked question after question after question, which was really good. At Key Stage 4, the issue was fitting all the serious road safety issues into a programme during a period where exams at this age group take precedence in the UK. So it was difficult to get that, in, that set into the educational curriculum, which we did overcome. We have just been, we've just finished our second year and we were 100% successful in delivery of these two Key Stage programmes to all our schools, 130 primary schools and 21 high schools. We looked to the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents, ROSPA, with regard to evaluation. We worked with them to develop a model in line with their Evaluate Toolkit. We sent a member of staff, I sent a member of staff to work with ROSPA to develop this area of the programme. We knew we had to evaluate the programme, we had to report annually on this programme and we have got this contract for four years with a further two year secondment. The service we are delivering in our county of Cheshire. We as a service have fully embraced this education in road safety. This may look complex but I'll tell you it's not. The diagram shows the way in which the aims and objectives of the educational program were directed at both Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 4. and They are di directly linked to the causes of deaths and injuries. First, we looked at the KSI da data, which is up on the far corner. The causes behind the deaths and injuries. This information then drove the shape of the contract between ourselves, the fire service and Cheshire East Local Authority Council. The goal was ultimately that both parties wanted, wanted was to achieve a reduction in casualties to the young. The aim is how we look to get where we wanted to be in the future. Key Stage 2 looked at safer routes to schools, walking, cycling. One of our colleagues spoke earlier just before lunch about bicycling and that's exactly what we're looking to do. And we also looked at distractions mobile phones, iPods, whilst walking and cycling. Key Stage 4 
took a little different route distraction from an older point of view including seatbelt wearing it's better to be cool than be dead cool drink and drug driving passengers and peer pressure the evaluation was undertaken before and after surveys where a hundred young people out of each group we measured the difference between their behaviors and attitudes against young people who had not received the presentation this work is in progress and will be continued over the next four years. Early findings though, from the first two years of this project, show real positive results. So that real positive feedback, education works. Education, education, education. So look ahead. Across the UK, fire and rescue services have utilized CFOA. Chief Fire Officers Association who are the professional voice of the UK Fire and Rescue Services who guide individual Fire and Rescue Services to achieve their goals in many many areas of business and in this case road safety. Together we have written a three-year strategy and are now in the process of delivering this strategy showing the direction CFOA wish to direct individual Fire and Rescue Services to travel. The future role of the UK Fire and Rescue Services in providing road safety education because we are not an enforcement body. That is the police's op. Nor are we an engineering company. But we are extremely good at engaging, especially with young people. Fire and Rescue Service in the UK has a statutory duty to attend road traffic collisions, but not to deliver road safety education. In 2011 and 2012, there were 380 fire-related deaths in Britain. In 2011-2012, there were nearly 1,800 people killed on Britain's roads. More than four times people die on the road than from fire. The British government have signalled to the fire and rescue services need to take on a wider role to make our societies safer for all, not just from fire. We are, they are looking to us to be more of a community protection agency and that work goes on through our uh, integrated risk management plans which we have to pr produce on an annual basis. Fire and Rescue Services are looking to link with the government's national framework for road safety as an educator looking to embrace the big society through collaboration not as a statutory role but as a commission service. We are looking to bring value to our local authorities and in this case real value to Cheshire East Council. But that's not all. We are delivering real value to real people, to all the students and young people with whom we engage. That is who we are really looking to serve to make a real difference to society in reducing casualties, misery and mayhem to families. This is proving that the fire and rescue services can deliver first class educational road safety interventions either individually or in partnership. The cost of a life in the UK is approximately 1.6 million pounds for each and every road death. The cost of this program that my fire and rescue service is delivering on behalf of Cheshire East Council costs £60,000. Peanuts, I would say. This is proving to be a real winner for all. Education, education, education. Uh, Mr Doyle, two minutes please. This is the road safety strategy from CFOA and I have some with me if anybody wants to take one away. Fire, fire and rescue services across the UK have a flexible model around engagement. Many fire and rescue services visit schools and communities as well as making fire stations welcoming buildings that can be used for the community showing that we are good role models. Fire and rescue services don't just look at what their core duties are now. They are looking to expand their expertise through school visits, etc. Fire and rescue services 
are involved in much more than just preventing fires and engaging with people to heighten awareness, looking at changing attitudes and behaviours. Fire and Rescue Services have an excellent track record in preventing fire and other incidents. We have reduced 50% fire over the last 10 years, 50% reduction in those killed and seriously injured in fires over the last 10 years, large reduction in arson related fires. We have not just done this overnight, it has taken many, many years, but what we do have is experience. So we can do it, you can do it. It just needs vision, planning and perseverance and a little help from your friends to point you in the right direction. That's exactly what the last speaker said, Dan and Kevin. If you need some help, there are people out there available to you. Road safety is not an accident. It's about graduated learning from an early age. Education, education, education. Thank you for listening to me today. If anybody has any questions, feel free to see me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Doyle. Do you have any question? No? Okay. And see you tomorrow and half hour later for foreign participants. <laughs>